Right, hello and welcome to our brand new season of Gram History Lesson. Very special guest today, the first Grand DJ to pioneer Graham on national radio, am I correct? One of. One of, who was the first one? Um, what well, there was people playing it on national radio. No, but to have a fully Graham show. I had the first dedicated Graham show on national legal radio, yes. That was you? I'll take that one, yeah. DJ Logan Sama. Thank you very much. What is going on? I don't like to take credit for things that I haven't done, do you know what I mean? And there's loads of people that are playing Grime on no, radio as well. No, but a full dedicated Grime show. You're right, you're right. For two yeah. hours. Yeah, yeah. You've got to take credit for that. I'll have that one. I'll, t I'll yeah. take that one, yeah. How did that feel? Um, it was just an exciting time, do you know what I mean? Like, obviously the music was new and it kept going up and up and up. Um, from when we didn't have a name for it in like 0102 to seeing all of the awards and all the critical acclaim that was going on in like 2003 uh, and then getting that KISS show, you know, was a huge deal for me, uh, especially with the calibre of DJs that were on there already, you know, obviously, like EZ's the reason why I started mixing in the first place. Um, guys like DJ Hype, Rodigan, Shorty Blitz and MK, uh, you know, it was an incredible lineup, and it was something I'd grown up listening to. I think Kiss FM is probably the reason why I got into like UK garage music in the first place. To get to DJ on there was a huge deal. Was that deal from for listening me. to Ezid's show? No, Ezid wasn't even on there yet. It was like okay. Steve Jackson in the morning. Um, he had a breakfast show and an evening show as well. I think it was on Tuesday nights. Um, and then Ezid got on there a little bit later. Like them times I was listening to Ezid on Freak FM. On Freak Course. Yeah, so. So. Growing up in Essex, yes. what was the music scene like growing up? Was there a scene? Uh, yeah, loads. The cool thing about Essex is it's like really adjacent to East London, so there's a really thriving club scene there. Um, you know, there's a lot of affluent areas in and around Essex, so lots of clubs being built around that sort of mid to late 90s time. Um, so much going on in in like Romford, which obviously like crosses the border between East London and, and, and Essex, so... As a kid, I'd go out to Hollywoods and Time and Envy, as it was called yep. then. And like Time and Envy basically made me fall in love with, with garage music. Uh, was so. there a particular moment in Time and Envy where you nah, went man, any I just, it, it was It was every week. Like I'd go there every week. Uh, and whoever was doing the bookings in there was smashing it because I'd go there every week and see like the biggest garage DJs in London playing. Like I'd see the EZ loads of times. Um, tough Jam. Uh, Mike Roughcut Lloyd, Martin Lana, like real technically proficient DJs showing off and I could see them in, in, in person performing and, and, and watch what they did. So that was really inspiring in terms of making me want to go and buy decks myself. So as what happened, you, did, was you buy records first or did you go and buy decks? Yeah, records? like I'm a, I'm a collector. If, if I'm into stuff, I just collect it anyway. So like as I was, a, when I was a little teenager, like 11, 12, I was into comic books and Warhammer and I'd collect all that video games, Super Nintendo, all of that stuff. And then as I got older, I got into like more my sports and clothes and obviously going out and, and consuming music more. And I would just buy records just to have them because a lot of the stuff that was coming out in Garage at the time, a handful of it would be commercially released and that was much later on um and i'm just like obsessive with anything i'm into anything i'm like a fan of anything i'm passionate about i i dive all the way in so obviously as soon as i got into garage um in the 90s pirate radio taping radio shows writing down all the tunes and yeah eventually oh, that what you was doing writing down all the tunes yeah i listen to the shows right there because obviously in that era everyone's playing unreleased stuff to promote it so I'm writing everything down. I was the annoying kid that would just go into all the record shops in London. Have you got this one yet? Have you got like I had notes, written notes. Like, have you got this one yet? Have you got I this one yet? Story. Is this in yet? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And I'd go Planet Fat. I'd go Uptown Records. I'd go Release the Groove. I'd go all over the gaff um, when I was starting out just to just to pick up records. So in terms of pirate radio, you said you was listening to pirate radio, Grand yeah. Time and everything. When did your career start on radio? Um, I kind of messed around uh, a couple of local um, stations in Essex. I think the first thing I ever did would have been a station in Billericay called Plush FM with yep. um, someone called Sus and Rip Lash, who um, both like lived in my immediate area, and I knew them from when I was younger. 
And from there, I kind of just got involved in online communities through forums, like linked up with people, made more networks through going to events in London. And just like, was like super obsessive with getting hold of music and playing music and learning how to mix and improving my mixing and improving everything and just taking opportunities. Got asked to do a demo for Rinse and then uh, by Doug's, Doug's asked me to demo for Rinse. Um, and my first, my, surf, my first ever Rinse show was in the studio in Dagenham Heathway whilst Pay As You Go were getting interviewed by The Observer Music um, Monthly on the sofa in the studio behind me whilst I was doing my first ever show. Really? And then after that, Roll Deep run after me on a Friday. So like, Yeah, you were seven to one hours enough? Yeah. Yeah. So like I was all set from then basically. Like just I'd do my radio show and I'd just sit and listen to whatever mad music was being made by these geniuses like, you know, Will and Danny and Wonder and all the other stuff they were playing from this this sound that just didn't have any name or rules or anything. It was just mad, blew my mind. So how did Doug's notice you? Uh, I was just an annoying prick on forums and I think he just liked me. What, did he like the knowledge that you was asking yeah, yeah, about yeah. certain dubs that weren't out and you knew the name of? Just like, just how involved I was with, uh, firstly, Uptown forums, but then like Rewind magazine. Like I was just super involved, super passionate. I, need, I needed to know everything about everything. I'd ask... I'd answer if people wanted to know stuff. I was like just really involved. Um, and yeah, Doug just said, do you want to just record a demo? So I, I put like little mix up, little 20, mix, 20 minute mixes up with whatever white label promos I could get from like Black Market and Uptown and Planet Fat and whatever. This is like, this is like musical mob, Zinc, like bingo records, yep. uh, DJ Narrows, that kind of era then. So you know, like Age of the- X. So just before Grime was really... That's what I wanted to ask right. you. When did you notice? You see, like the zinc uh, narrows. What era? When did you notice things getting moving away from garage? Obviously, you was a garage head, and how did you feel about that? I am. I personally moved away from garage because it was becoming very homogenous. Like it was really generic, um, like two step remixes of commercial singles that were just all Robin Sunship production yeah, style. Yeah, 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 sunship, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? And everything was sounding mad samey. That exciting width and experimentation that was happening in Underground Garage kind of like narrowed right down. And like for me, obviously, like EZ's my inspiration. I'll give EZ credit until my last breath because I think he's the greatest DJ this country's ever produced. Um, but the thing that was really amazing about, about EZ was the width of music that he would like he would cram it into a set you know like you're packing your suitcase for your holiday and you double footing tunes in like he would cram techno breakbeat rap disco house all into because he if he could mix it he'd put it in so for me it was all about yeah this width of sound and I'm, i don't know what's coming next when uk garage just all started sounding like the yeah like everything was the same Everyone's using the same kind of styles. Like, it kind of lost me because I got into it from Steve Gurley, Dem2, Wookie, MJ Cole, Grant Nelson. That's such a width of sounds when you put that next to, like, Tough Jam, Todd Edwards, Jeremy Sylvester. Like, it's a width, a big width of of sound. Yeah, very musical producers. It's all garage, but it's all different. Everyone's, uh, and then when it all became the same, it kind of put me off. At the same time as this happening, there's this there's this kid in Bow called Dizzy Rascal who's making music that sounds like it's from another planet, you know. He was making music that sounded like he was going through the keyboard in the studio and just purposely trying to find the sounds that no one else wanted to use and then making music out of it. I thought that was amazing, you know. At the same time, Wiley's coming every week with like four or five new tunes and they're all slapping at the same time as Danny, at the same time as, you know, Genius was making big tunes at the time as well. Um, Target, Wonder, amazing music. That's not even including what I'm hearing on Deja from, you know, the legend like Terra Danger, Jamma, um, you know, and then obviously Skepta, Da Vinci, 
stuff on the other side as well. At the same time as all this happening, I've got like Musical Mob and Johnny Cash in West London making music that sounds like it's from a different galaxy as well. So this thing that my brain loves, like are all these mad new sounds that all work in one set, I'm getting it from here now, you know? And and that's what really drew me to it. Um, How did you come across it? Was it listening to Rinse FM? You just hear it in underground sets, you know what I mean? The underground uh, UK garage sets. Because... So what what DJs did you hear play this sort of dark up garage on a cuff of gram? That like obviously pays ago, super important. Heartless Crew were playing again. They took fit anything into a set and pushed it even further. You know, Chris Biscuit mixes and stuff. Mm. First place I ever heard Pulse X was Heartless Crew playing it. Yeah, funny you had that first actually. Yeah, um, and. Obviously, the exciting new DJs that were, were coming through, like Mac 10 was uh, a mixing robot. You know, the speed at which Mac 10 could mix two records together made no sense. Frightening. Yeah. Um, incredible. And obviously, the dubs that he's playing, mad. I'm around really cool people in Uptown Records, which was right near where I used to go university. So, like, people like Jay Sweet and DJ Cameo, who were also, like, really passionate about the music. Loved Garage as well, but liked moving towards this darker sound. And it's really exciting all over the place, you know. So you spent a lot of time in Uptown Records? Like, Uptown yeah. Records, I spent loads of time. Used their online forums a lot. And I think that was really important that they had like an actual forum based around their record shop, which other shops didn't really have. Um, and it just really fostered the community. But I'd also, you know, go Planet Fat on Caledonian Road a lot. Um, so I met Sammy B. Go and cut dubs with Ollie and Tubby downstairs. That's how I met Slimzy. Um, and yeah, just I, I just go around places and network and, um, and buy records and find records and listen to new music and hear what people were doing. Um, then I started going cutting houses like Music House, JTS, and met even more people. And, you know, for me as, again, I'll go back to it, me as someone who's an excited collector obsessive collector as i unlock even more music through producers you know new crews new radio stations of whole new you know rosters of talent that i can interact with it was amazing there was so much cool stuff going on and i could talk to you for four hours and still not mention everybody that i came into contact with and that was responsible for me you know falling in love with what would become grime so you get your show on Rinse. Yeah. Was that always a goal, to be on Rinse? Not really. Um, I never really thought about DJing for a job, to no. be honest with you, no. It was just a hobby. Just... I just loved it. It was just something I did. And and me doing things that I love doing is something I'd always poured hours and hours and hours into anyway, um, you know, from when I was a kid. Draw, read comics, paint stuff playing football for hours, whatever I, whatever I did, I did it way too much, like obsessively. And that happened with DJing as well. I'd be, you know, mixed for six hours until the night, you know, only listening to music in my headphones in yeah. my mum's house so that the speakers weren't on. And that's actually how I learned to mix. I learned how to mix only in headphones. Oh, really? Yeah, so I don't even use um, a monitor. Oh, is that how you, that yeah, how you yeah, learn? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just mix in the headphones entirely, which is cool to play out because I don't care if there's delay or whatever. But um, yeah, I, I, I think for me, it was really exciting getting on Rinse because there was so much going on that I liked at the time. You know, it was a place where there was so much new, exciting musical experimentation going on. Um, you know, for me, Super Sundays on Rinse was a... Never miss. Never. Deja on Monday nights, never miss. And there was just so much incredible stuff going on at the time. So in terms of you getting a rinse, obviously you was you was more presenting, Graham. You was talking sort of in between. Yeah, I got on rinse and I realised that everyone's going on rinse and just playing brand new dubs. So that doesn't really set me apart at all. Um, everyone's good. Everyone's cutting a million tunes a week. And for me to just match that, isn't really doing anything different. 
Did you have a job at the time? Obviously, cutting is quite expensive. No, I was no. in uni, so right. and I I don't drink, smoke, or do drugs, so I've got no expenditure or nothing, mate. To be honest with you, the only vice I've got is buying too many trainers. Yeah. Um, so I just put all my money into cutting, and even then, I put all my money into cutting, and that was still just all right. You're just at this. This is the starting level because everyone's cutting. You're no different to anybody else, you know. And at the time, like Slimzy's the the father, so. He's cutting everything before you anyway, so why are you trying to, don't try and do that. I'm not in a crew, so Danny and Carnage and Bionics, they're going to have them tunes before me and, you know, they, they're like, so what can I do? Okay, I can I can talk reasonably well about things that I'm excited about. And he's, oh, so let me do that. And I, you know, I've always been a fan of um, what people like Westwood and Rodigan did on the radio in terms of helping to showcase music that they truly loved. Um, and also, you know, guys like K Slay and um, those guys in America, Funkmaster Flex, that were doing so much exposition on the culture and what was happening and the actual scene rather than just the music. So I kind of went away and focused on just doing a show that was informative, you know. So it was more vocals than instrumentals, would you say? Um, I would focus on playing new vocals and promoting new projects when I was on Rinse, but always with a set. There was always a set because I just loved doing sets with MCs. So and I noticed that you was, in terms of your sets, you're doing a lot of Roll Deep at the time. Well, that was, that was just it was on Rinse. Do you know what I mean? And, and at the time, it was very difficult to get artists on Rinse. You needed to get approvals from the management and what have you. I couldn't just have people turn up, you know, and... Yeah, I did do a couple of other shows with 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 other people, but it was quite hard to get a lot of other talent on rinse in like O two. So is that something you wanted to do? Yeah, and I went on a couple like did a couple um, shows on other stations as well. Did some guest shows on Freeze in West London, and there's another one in West West London. Name can't remember. But yeah, I was all over the gaff, man. Like, I just liked going and hearing new shit and playing playing with new artists. But obviously, Rinse was like, pay as you go slash roll deeps, home stadium. So they're always about. So when you got your show, you was always, was always Friday, 7 to 9? Yeah. In the deep end straight away, really? Exactly, in at the deep end, no pun intended. Um, yeah, I think no that was great. Intended. I yeah. think that was great because, um, you know, it got me a lot of ears rather than eyes on the show because it was the show before Rin, uh, Roll Deep. Friday night's a good time to be on as well. Um, and I guess kind of Doug's, Doug's probably saw the vision before I did, you know, putting me in there. And um, I just went on and spoke and presented and obviously it worked really well. What was the feedback? Like obviously you were battling those phone lines and then the forums. What was people saying about you? Obviously, it wasn't a normal thing to do, really, presenting Graham. It was more um, just drawing I for dubs, getting engagement. I just looked at the engagement. You know, people were listening. I was getting people texting and miscalling for tunes. And realistically, the most important thing for me was the feedback from my peers and getting to meet and talk to other Graham producers, DJs, MCs, crews, collectives, labels, and then obviously liking what I was doing on the radio and then giving me their music to promote, that was the thing for me. You know, that was my stamp of approval. And like, that's kind of always has been, you know, like my peers is who I take my stamp of approval from. So back then, what would we find in the record bag, like a typical 7 to 9 Rinse Femme Logan show? Um, It was you sort of really pushing and really felt you were going the extra mile before you really want to promote this person's music. Just for whoever was active, to be honest with you. Just to, whoever was active, like a lot of Roll Deep, a lot of Nasty Crew, a um, lot of um, Boys in the Hood, Dogs, Titch, um, Terror Danger and Aftershock always. Uh, you know, I think Terror Danger and Aftershock did a lot in terms of the professionalism of, of, of the way that they conducted themselves and ran that label compared to sort of like the fly by the seat of your pants white label approaches a lot what of people What set them had. apart from the other sort of collective slash labels? 
just the just the way that the label was run, man. Um, you know, the, everything was labelled up. You didn't see any dirty white labels from them. It was all professional things, release schedules, promos, that kind of stuff. You know, a little bit, a uh, little bit longer um, plans, I guess, rather than done this this week onto the next thing. Um, but the quality was still there. It wasn't like watered down to be more professional. It still was amazing, mind blowing music. Him and like Magnum and then DOK later on. Yeah, it's a wicked, wicked time, man. Um, what else was I playing? Obviously, like G, Skepta, Jammer, Da Vinci. Yep. Loads of Da Vinci and Essentials. Uh, Eastwood, loads of Eastwood. Um, Johnny Cash. Going back now. Yeah. Um, the explicit. Loads of, I mean, yeah. I, one of my biggest shortcomings is doing lists and remembering things. I really have to sit down and get my pen and paper out and really write through stuff and go through it a lot. But I, I really just tried to cover as much as I could back then, you know. Um, if I saw people working consistently and trying to build and elevate themselves, I would always try and support that because for me that was really important to see these talented people elevate themselves in their, you know, in their place in life. For me, that was a big part of what I loved about grime. You know, kids off the estate really just trying to have a voice and be heard in a time in which uh, it was, you know, there was so much negativity and so much stuff being like with stuff like Form 696 uh, and the culture being shut down, stop and search being so prevalent as well. Like it was just a, a complete shutdown of that culture and that demographic, especially, you know, how it affects young black men specifically. Uh, and for me to have a platform where I could present their art that they were making in a professional way, that was really important for me because even now, 20 plus years later, it really pains me how grime was not accepted as you know, one of the highest forms of art that we've created in this country. It was just some li little thing, kids messing about because they didn't have access to big studios or this, that, and, or, or, um, you know, music education, classical training, big business infrastructure. That's what made it more exciting to me. That's what made it even greater. The fact that teenagers in college were doing all of this themselves. I thought that was so important and to platform those voices and to support that kind of grind and be a part of elevating bedroom enthusiasts to becoming professional musicians with careers was always important to me. That's why I always feel a bit emotional whenever I see anyone out of the scene achieving stuff beyond it, you know, whether that's Skepta, who's been doing it for a very long time now, or, you know, guys like Big Zoo is achieving so much outside of the, the music industry as well. I, I'm just really happy to see people succeed because I know where most of these guys have come from. So at the time, moving forward to about 2004, where sort of label interest comes in for some of these artists, how did you feel as a DJ? Um, like your Kano's, your Dizzy. I thought it was cool because they were just like, yeah, we want a bit of that. We'll have a bit of that, actually. Um... And it was getting critical. It was new and exciting. So it was being taken for what it was. Um, you know, obviously Dizzy kicked the doors off, um, won the Mercury Prize. Wiley's album came out. Um, and I feel like we weren't able to capitalize maybe as much on how iconic and important Wiley's influence was at the time of that album why wasn't we what second um, sorry Treading the Thin Ice yeah just the way that like there was never able to be like a proper Eskimo or Igloo uh, sorry Eskimo or Ice Rink vocal and those beats were so like important and to like I feel even to this day that, that there wasn't a a big song voiced on those for the album that really went further in the same way that Igloo and what you call it happened um that was always a shame for me because the, what Wiley did as a as a musician, both vocally and as a composer, right, really cannot be overestimated. 
in those times. Um, what was your relationship with Wiley um, back in the rinse days? Was you quite close? So I was on the show before Roll Deep, so naturally I was in the studio when Wiley was there, and I was just got to meet him through that. Um, and uh, we started talking just about you know his process of of how he did business and worked and I felt like I could help a little bit. So, um, yeah, for a, for a few months, I kind of helped out making sure that um, he was able to focus most of his time and attention on making music and then help facilitate getting stuff out and getting studio booked and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Exciting times. So in terms of instrumentals, we spoke about Garage getting dark up. But in terms of grime instrumentals back then, yeah. what what few tunes would you say was really influential to sort of define the sound of grime? Crikey. Um, fuck. What kind of era are we talking like when it first started? So between 2001, two, between 2004, we'll say between 2001 and 2004, especially when you was gone rinse. Do apologise for forgetting the tunes that I am about to forget. So I'll say that in advance. Um, <clears throat> let's go for the obvious ones. Eskimo, Pulse X, I Love You. Jammer Destruction. Um, I think what Skepta did with Pulse Eskimo, Gunshot Rhythm was mad. That was super exciting. Um, I think what Terra Danger did with Creepy Crawler really pushed things in a different direction. I think one of the most important records that was made in terms of opening different areas for grime would have been DJ Wonders What as well, like the half step and how that worked in obviously straight up grime sets, but at the same time, kind of gave us something to push back into dubstep with at the same time as we were taken from dubstep and it became like a, a sharing relationship rather than one-sided. Um, what else at the time? Bloody hell. Uh, forward rhythm was mad um, vocally, but also production-wise because one of the cool things about grime, to go on a tangent, one of the cool things about grime is it never really got to be rinsed in the mainstream because there was no like stereotypical grime sound. Because um, even though Wiley was using the Korg cool Triton and the Proteus for other sounds, there wasn't like a stereotypical beat that he used or a pattern that he used. Like, it was all quiet. It was just... It's like, this is my palette. Like an artist had a palette of colours that he used, but he was painting landscapes and portraits and they were all different. Do you know what I mean? And that's what Wiley was doing. So it's really hard to like take that as a major label and copy it. And I think one of the only instances I ever saw of a label trying to copy a grime tune was um, the explicit forward rhythm. Uh, because the the percussion was so distinctive, um, and they made the tune called "Never Gonna Say Bye Bye" by what was it? Never gonna say bye. Yeah, uh, who was that? The Soundboy Entertainment or something like that. Right. It was. It's lit. They literally just put a, a, a sappy saccharine vocal over the top of just the drums. Did you play that? Definitely <laughs> not. Definitely not. Um, but yeah, that's like one of the most distinctive productions of that era. Um, but there's so many, you know, I've always loved um, the musical mob stuff. I've always loved Johnny Cash's music. Because again, the, the, the fun thing for me about Grime at that era was like, for you to get into Grime as a producer, you had to have a new sound. You couldn't come in and do a Wiley type beat because no one would play it. You couldn't come in and do a Terror Danger type beat, a Jammer type beat. Um, that's probably a bad example. But 
Oh, you couldn't know. It was really frowned upon. Now you you can people yeah. do do that. And to it's be more fair, accepted. Like, there was a, a few producers out there who their early productions did sound like other people, but then they diverged and and, and found their own voices. But um, the the big thing was like finding a new bass, finding a new sound, finding new stuff. You know, and that's how you discover like. Eastwoods and P jams and these guys coming through because I'd know their tunes immediately because they stood out from other people's tunes. Like J Sweet tunes stood yeah. out from other people's but tunes. And then you wouldn't need a producer tag, you'll just know you hear the yeah, instrument would you know bait, he made like, it. And if I I'd, I'd be like, well, who's that then? It would stand out on the set because it would be new. And for me that was really exciting. Um you know, that was the cool thing for me about Grime in that era. And I think maybe eight years later, when everyone just started trying to make tunes using Wiley sounds, I appreciate why people were doing it. And it was fun to play with the palette and experiment with it. But that was really contrary to what I enjoyed about Grime, which was people coming and discovering and working with brand new sounds. That's the thing. I mean, I, that's what I mentioned about Dizzy. Dizzy's beat sounded like he was purposely trying to use the sounds that no one wanted to use. I just feel like people was doing that eight, nine years on because they felt like that was the sound of Grime. That is Grime House. Grime yeah, to sound them, that's like. what they remember. Yeah, yeah. And they wanted to experiment with it. I don't know if it's like cosplaying as those that producer sounds or if it's... Because music and art is all about reinterpretation until you find something new. And that's obviously really important. And I don't want to disparage people that are using other people's sounds but for me it's not what I enjoyed personally and I think art is a very personal thing that's why I don't like ranking I hate ranking I hate charts I don't like saying this is better than that specifically like this is number one and this is number three this is number two I hate that do I like this yes is this for me yes is that for me no but I can see that other people do wicked and that's what you need you need a width of music and that's what I had from grime or width because there might have been some stuff over there that's like, okay, that's a bit, that's a bit, you know, discordant for my ears. You know, it's a bit harsh and abrasive and not the melodic riff driven stuff that I like. Is that what you, so that's the grime you like, the melodies, more softer. I loved, not softer, definitely not recognizable stuff. Recognizable. I like, I like grime that's like theme music. Name me one instrumental yeah. that would define your, that, your favourite sound of grime? Um, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I guess like Eskimo. Do you know what I like? Go on. Grime that you can put in a polyphonic ringtone. Jamie uh, made, uh, what was that Jamie instrument? Yeah, he did a ringtone tune. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the, that was literally the, just, yeah, just based a, off yeah. a ringtone. Okay, apart from Eskimo. But like, if the, if, the, if the top line of the tune is strong enough, for it to work and be recognisable as a polyphonic ringtone, and I'm sure many people watching this don't have a clue what a polyphonic ringtone is. Um, I like top line riffs, you know, in the same way that I like, I like dancehall for the same reason, you know, like Punani Ribbon, Rhythm, um, such a strong top line riff and the bass line riff. I love, I love riffs, like catchy, do you know what I mean? Um, I also like, the composer John Williams, who did like Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Superman, because it's like really strong riffs when Darth Vader's on the screen. He's got his sound when, when, and that's actually how I DJ. Like, I want to give everyone their own entrance, like wrestling, bruv. Like, I grew up on wrestling. I'm a massive wrestling fan. I like theme music and I love recognizable stuff. So for me, there's a beauty in the ability to be able to write riffs. I think technical production skill is amazing but the god-given talent to write a riff or a melody is its own thing and i love that and i think that the strongest era of grime was when i could i, I could walk into a record shop and hum a tune do you know what i mean and i know exactly oh, what oh yeah that one yeah yeah cool so, Rinse, you was on there. How long was you on there for? Five years? Nah, bro. I was on Rinse from 2002 to 2004. 2002 to 2004? Yeah, not long. Not long at all? No. Not long at all? Did it go quick? No, because at the time, that was like the first time I'd ever done a weekly, weekly show. So, no, I was loving it, man. You know? 
I'd do the weekly show. I'd go and do guest shows in the midweek. I'd be cutting dubs. I'd go cut dubs. Like having a show on a Friday was jokes as well because I'd be in the music house on Friday. Or Before JTS. your show. And I'm like, oh shit, man. I hope he comes and brings a CD. I hope he comes. I've got to leave in. You know, I'm cutting it so fine. And I'm turning up to radio with dubs I've just cut and I've never played. Like I've never heard them. <laughs> the only time I've heard them is when they're being cut. Bit risky, isn't it? Sometimes. Yeah, it's not life. I'm not doing the heart surgery. If I clang on the radio, I clang on the radio. Do you know what I mean? And like, obviously I've had moments where people have been annoyed with me mixing records in a way that they don't like me to. But again, they're records that were given to me as they walked in the studio and I've never heard them before. So for me, what that's exciting. you going practice in your bedroom for like a couple of days before I've never then. been that kind of like, oh, this blend. I know it's a big thing now. Like, oh, yeah, this blend. This is my blend. I'm going to go and do that. Like for me, that... Again, that's not what I enjoy about DJ, and I love the chaos of it, man. I like I like making new stuff every time. I love it so much, you know. Um, I love the chaos of live sets with MCs because every time you're doing a set, you're getting new permutations of lyrics and beats and mixes, and this MC comes in after this MC, and like there's infinite possibilities. And again, like you'll probably notice themes here. I just my brain just th the dopamine is just. Like new, 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 new combinations, new possibilities. That's that's what I love. You know, I love that, and you know that that style of yeah. I'll just go to the radio and mix stuff. I've just cut that day. It was fun for me. I've I've done it from two thousand and two. You know, maybe it's the greatest mix I've ever done in my life. Maybe it's just an eight bar blend, and I just drop it in because it doesn't sound the best. But it's fun for me. That that's what I really enjoy. You know, putting myself on the spot and doing it like that. So, how did it come to an end on Rinse? I got offered a show on Kiss. <laughs> Pretty straightforward. So, was did that come by surprise? Did you know yeah. Kiss was sniffing around you? No, no, no. Um, Chris Blackley, who was a producer at Kiss FM, asked me to record a demo, uh, which was broadcast right away as a cover show. Uh, DJ was on tour in a different country. They put out two cover shows. When he got back from tour, he didn't have a show anymore, and I had his show. So, yeah. So, what are you thinking when Kiss coming for you? Doing cartwheels, you're like, yeah, that's over huge the moon. for me. For me, that's huge. Like, now that I'm in radio, now that I've done a weekly show for two years, now that I'm thinking, okay, DJing is actually something I could do. For me, Kiss is like the most exciting station in the country for what I want to do because the DJs that I look up to are there, predominantly EZ and Rodigan. But like I respected hype, even though I'm not a jungle or drum and bass head. I respected Shorty Blitz. I respected MK. Um, I'm Big Ted, and like for me to to get onto Kiss was huge. For they me. explain to you why they wanted you. So obviously there was other DJs around at that time. Did they did they say to you why the the the, the format that my show was in? So what I was trying to do to stand out and do something different actually worked in my favour. Because I know that they tried to, not kiss, but I know that legal radio stations were interested in what Slimzy was doing. I know they were interested in what Matt Ten was doing because they are incredible DJs. Um, but I guess what happened with Kiss is they wanted someone to come and present the culture and I was able to do that, you know, present the music. So, what time was your show? Obviously, I know your your slot, your shut the time changed a few times, didn't it? I cannot remember. I when thought my it was first one till three. Was. One day it was in the middle of the night. It yeah. might have been in midweek, and then I got moved. Someone said, I think someone said Thursday or something. But I, don't know. I was going to say Thursday. I think it would have been Thursday one till three. Then it got moved to Monday nights at a reasonable hour. There was a one. Yeah. Um, we all remember the one till three is Monday. Yeah. So. You know, eleven to one was the big, the big successful time. But that's great. You know, I'm like I'm on a legal radio station, and they're getting amazing feedback. They're getting great engagement, uh, and I just keep getting basically promoted. It was great. So, how did things change from being a rinse where you could basically do what you want, cut your dubs on a Friday? What was different to being on national radio and you're presenting? You're literally putting Graham to the whole of England basically the only thing that was different was I had, I had to cut my dubs on the weekend that's <laughs> because yeah. I couldn't be late for radio but other than that nothing they you know the producers were you know all credit to Chris Blackley there was no 
there was almost no input on their side. In, in terms, terms of, of music me, you should play and stuff like that. Even the format of the show, like I just turned up, recorded to it. Like that. And I think that's off the strength of what I was already doing on Rinse every week. Um, you know, another thing that I did was I put together, so we haven't really discussed this, but Sidewinder is incredibly important. For We're willing music. to talk about that, yeah, the um, bookings and stuff. So let's go. Sidewinder is basically the place that allowed underground garage to thrive and evolve into what became grime that real raw street culture and the sounds being really bass heavy rave orientated not daytime radio bouncy two-step garage brunch kind of vibes um and obviously Sidewinder tape packs were a huge thing, a huge thing to be on, you know, from the live. But they started doing bonus discs. They did, yeah. DVDs and when and I stuff. was on when I was on Rinse, like they started doing bonus discs with DJs that hadn't yet played at Sidewinder. So I actually put together a CD with like loads of dubs. Like I think I played about sixty tunes on a fifty-minute CD. Like I'm, I'm trying to juggle. Like it's a juggling disc. It's not a mix. I'm literally juggling, and I'm basically talking like you're, of, like you're in the rave. Basically, I'm hosting over it as well. I thought, you know what? I'm going to do this CD. People are going to have it in their cars. It's going to have every artist that is popping right now on this underground, this new grime level. This is going to be great. They're going to love this. I've got. You know, I, I made a bunch of splices where I took acapellas and put them over. Like I took Cartel, Dipset, like Elephant Man, all of these like acapellas that I could download off LimeWire and Kazar. Um, and I'm splicing you know. them over the big instruments like, um, you know. Was, when I'm here. Before that. that before, oh, before, before that. Before that. I'm on Rinse. When I'm here was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah so. Um, so I remember that um, yeah, yeah. Rock, you know what I'm talking about the, yeah, 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 the dubs came later yeah, on yeah. Um, and I thought yeah, this is a wicked promo CD I'm going to send it into Sidewinder and I sent it into Sidewinder and they never used it oh, they never used it so rather than sitting down and being sad I just used my mum's PC and burnt off 200 CDs and just went around five different record shops left 20, 40 on the counter with my details written on in pen, in plastic sleeves, and just left them there for people to pick up. Did you get bookings from that? I didn't get bookings, but Chris Blackley from Kiss hit me up. Um, and obviously I was active online and my shows were online to listen to as well because I would record and archive them. And that's how I got onto, onto Kiss. So that's quite an important thing. To, yeah, talking to about side, so did you... You, did you eventually get to play at one? I did eventually get to play at Sidewinder later on, yeah. yeah. Um, Do you remember the night, the format? Who I had can't remember which set? one was the first one, like because it's all Swindon so long ago. It's all like 20 years ago. I've played at Swindon. I played at Cambridge. I Milton never Keynes. got to play Milton Keynes. You didn't? Never got to play the, the Milton Keynes Bowl. Um, but yeah, like 04, 05 times, I started to get to play at Sidewinder. And again, I did the same thing where I'd play vocal splices, dub plates... If there was MCs on the set, I'd make sure that MCs got their showcase as well. If I was playing, there's 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 footage of me playing at a Sidewinder and, you know, Nasty Jack and Wiley are clashing each other. And, oh, you was on deck for that, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, Skepta's, Skepta and Jamie are part of Boy Better Know well, and I think... You're hating they, at their boss man. Hating boss yeah. man and what have you. And, you know, um, just getting to do fun things and for me, a huge deal. Sidewinder was so really, really important to the music and it was something that I listened to so frequently so to get to play there was awesome and to get to play there and do something different to everybody else because again I'm like I'm trying to play one away vocal dubs I'm trying to play the voices of the big artists that everyone cares about um you know I just wanted everyone to have fun man so what other ravers were close to your heart apart from the side wonder that you played back then if there was any early on um it's more venues you know more getting to play venues like yeah. we were talking about it just before we started recording but like ministry of sound we played there the other day for rinse but um ministry of sound was a huge venue back then because obviously it hadn't been open for that long it was like the biggest nightclub in london um bagley's on york way was a huge venue um 
And obviously, wherever Eskimo dance was, you got to play Eskimo dance and you were certified. Doing business, yeah. yeah. You know, so whether that's SE1, whether it's in Watford, um, that was a big deal as well. What was it like playing in Eskimo dance back then? Because obviously, it's changed now. Madness. What, what was that atmosphere? Madness. What was it like? It, Chaos. Tell us. Chaos. Madness. Everyone's, so, everyone's just waiting. It was really funny as well because the majority of the night at Eskimo dance was just people juggling the ragged dance hall and hip hop tunes and then you'd get the big set at the end um, but that big set at the end made up for it man it was crazy um, but yeah obviously everyone it's like a pack of hyenas like hanging around the watering hole and they're all waiting for they're all waiting for the antelope to just try and have a little drink of water so they can pounce it was it was that's, that was the vibe you know both on the stage and in the crowd probably but um, yeah it was wicked man um, so many people on top of their game, real like proper stage show vibes as well. You know, if you grew up watching or consuming sound system culture, you've seen any of the the big, big dances or like World Cup clashes or anything like that. Very, very similar kind of vibes. Um, but much younger as well, because like we're all new to it. So we're all just trying our version, um, so rather than having one big artist walk out and then another guy try and counteract him, 20 men are there. You know, like sting with one person. Everyone's going. Yeah. And it's all, everyone's getting the mic. And you, you know. What's it like DJing? Spinning six plates on sticks and trying to keep them all spinning at once. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm not tall. I'm only like five foot eight. So I'm like, I'm trying to see over. I can't see what's going on because there's 10 guys in front of the DJ booth. I can't even see the crowd. I don't know who's coming in next. I'm trying to. When you're DJing those kind of sets, your job is just you're, you're just to, you're just playing through balls, man. It's through balls, just through balls. Through no balls. Look who's spitting. Mixes. Look who's spitting. Is someone holding the hand out? All right, cool. Where is he in his bar? All right, cool. He's got eight more bars to go. I'm going to queue my tune up. Next guy, right? You get a drop. Boom. There you go. And then you keep doing it. Oh, you're not over. You're not trying to complicate it. You know, you might do a three bar blend, but I don't want to yeah. derail. I'm not there to derail. I'm not there to like. If if I'm mixing on those sets with like 15, 20 MCs and they're waiting for me to stop mixing, it kind of defeats the purpose because they everyone wants to hear them spit. Yeah. Yeah. But that's not, you know, that's just for that very specific dynamic. That's the cool thing about mixing grind. There's so many different dynamics. There is in there. Because I can go to another club and I'm just blending instrumentals together. What do you like, prefer? I, the chaos, man. Give me the chaos. I love the fucking chaos. Because you know what? Every DJ that's competent can go and blend in a club. If you practice and you know how to technically mix, you can go and do that. Every DJ can go and try and juggle some vocals. They can do that. That's fine. If I got other DJs from other genres to come and try and do a set for 5, 10, 15 grime MCs and not fuck that up, it's quite hard. It's a, re it's a unique skill and that's what I quite like. It might not on paper or like academically look like it's quantifiably difficult to do because, you know, I've just got to do the, got to flick the tune over. That's easy. And it's got, to, you know, the eight bar mix, flick it in. You got to keep it moving. You got to give the guys what they want as well. You got to keep it, yeah. You know what I mean? You can't play any duds. You're <laughs> you playing can't. these tunes for 32 bars. Like, don't, don't fuck the vibes no, up. No, 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 no. Do yeah. not fuck up the vibes. Um, you know, so that for me was, was always the, the most fun part, I think. Great memories. So let's go back to Kiss. So the first few months on there, what was you doing? The same format as Rinse or did it yeah, change a bit? Yeah, pretty much. I just turn up. Um, I'm dealing with a lot of artists that were giving me music. Obviously, I'm on Kiss now, so like it's a big deal for them. The only thing was different. Obviously, I had to clean the music. So that's why I needed the music a bit more. In and advance. let's do that yourself or did your producer do that? Predominantly did it myself. Um, but with help from the producers as well and the production assistants. Um, obviously, no one had radio edits of anything ever, so I basically had to edit the whole show before I played any songs on the radio. Um, but other than that, yeah, got to hit an hour and 58 minutes with ads, make sure I play everyone's tunes. So was you getting guests on straight away? Uh, yeah, it? I think so. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, it was more like come down, talk, do a freestyle, 
that kind of thing. Um, and then when they saw that I was able to do that and manage that and not fuck that up, they let me start doing sets as well. And then we got to like 2008 where we started filming the sets. Wanted to talk about that. Yeah. Why did you decide to start filming the sets? I was quite, uh, back then no one was really filming grime sets like that on, on radio, was well, they? Not on a regular basis. No. Nah. I mean, you had like Axe FM, shout out to Pablo forever. Yeah. That was like a webcam sort of. It was live live yeah. feed. Yeah. Pablo and the guys at Axe FM had live video streams in 2003, 2004. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which is mad. That's before Twitch. That's before YouTube Live. That's before Facebook. They, I don't know how they set that up, but, you know, rest in peace forever, Pablo. R.I.P. Pabs. You know, um, way ahead of its time. I think at a time like Westwood was filming freestyles. I, mean, I think Westwood right. he was kinda, really, He kind of was, yeah. He yeah. was. He, he had the Sunday night show, didn't um, he? Yeah. But I'll be honest, the reason why my shows got filmed was a young 16-year-old boy emailed me by the name of Jamal Edwards and said, you're doing sets on the radio. Would you like me to come and film them for you? And he started coming down and filming every week and editing and we, we, we set the Keeping It Grimy YouTube channel up together. Was it just for that, basically to put up your set? Yeah. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, just as Didn't a place. Didn't Kiss one uh, enough footage for their self? I don't think self. they cared about they it at the time. Nah. You know, I don't think they realised the value in it because like you said, it wasn't really a thing that anyone was doing. They weren't paying me to film them. They weren't paying Jamal to film them. It was something we were doing off our own backs. Um, obviously, Jamal would come down and network and, you know, link up with these grime artists and then record his own stuff and build up SBTV. But, for for the keeping it grimy stuff, it was literally just documenting the the weekly sets that we were doing. So that's all keeping grimy was. Yeah, just literally. You go you go on there and you look, and I think like the first video is Skepta uh, doing an interview and a freestyle um, in two thousand and eight, and then we got a couple more of those, and then we start getting into the sets in two thousand and eight, and the rest is history, obviously. So in terms of the sets, what who was the first few? So if you had Skepta. What sort of people was coming up? Was Everybody, you... man. Every, that was a cool thing about the show at the time. Like, everyone was coming through, whether it was Kano, Skepta, Getz, uh, through to, like, new artists in that era. Um, artists that had been going a while and deserved the support and the platform as well. Um, there was loads of... I tried to be as wide in my coverage as possible. Like, be really, really fair with it. And obviously... I think for the most part, people accepted that that was the cool thing about the show. Everyone got their, their feature and everyone got their time. Being on national radio, is there more pressure to no. fit more people, <laughs> you know, in terms of artists hitting you up now? No. Now everyone's hungry. Like, you know, I mean, obviously, you do, always do respect to Rinse. You want I never radio. really you, had that. Um, you didn't at all? No. Obviously, I don't really bullshit people. I'm very, very straight. And... Uh, more often than not, I would be proactive in reaching out to people because for me to go through everything, I, I I would listen to everything I got emailed, but for me to respond to everything I got emailed would have been a 25-hour-a-day job, which I just couldn't manage. But I was proactive in terms of reaching out to people that I saw being consistent with their work and getting shine for it because for me at the time, that was the national platform for grime music. So... If I didn't see you doing pirate radio regularly, if I didn't see you doing sets regularly, if I didn't see you putting mixtapes out or whatever, it was of my belief that the national platform for grime wasn't for you yet, which I think was fair. Most people were most people were cool with because when they did do the work, they got the they got the I, chance. I was a man of my word, you know, um, and I tried to be very fair with what I was playing and who was getting heard and. You know, what the people wanted to hear as well. I think that was very important to me, like really covering what was going on in Grime. Yeah, because talking about covering what was going on in Grime, people to this day talk about the War Report show. Yeah. 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 So what was that for you, just playing dubs or what was going so on So I'd already time? done something like that on Rinse, actually, um, when Wiley and Dukes were going at each other. And I was turning up every week and just playing new dubs. I'd done that before as well with Lee Four. And Rico. Oh, we, oh, Rico. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nico. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so, like, I was, again, really fair with that. Just 
Here's the new dub. Let's take a listen to it. Boom, play it. We're not taking any sides. I'm just here to present you what's going on. Um, so I'd already done that on, on Rinse. So to do it on Kiss was really exciting because it's like a much bigger audience. Um, and at the time, the platform was so important to the artist to make sure that they would get me the tune to be heard the next week. Now it's like, got 24 hours to reply. I want it uploaded to Twitter tomorrow with a music video. But then it was like, we'll wait till next week. Wait till Monday. Yeah, it was cool. It was cool. You know, it's like a, like a TV series, you know, what's going to happen next episode. You've got to wait till next Monday to find out kind of thing. Um, and obviously at the end of it, after a couple of months, I put together the, I put together everything. There's like a compilation um, for free download for people to get hold so of. So what was on there? The movement, this is Wiley. Movement, Wiley, Frisco, God's Gift. Um, you know, a bunch Cold of blooded, stuff. I think Revolver and that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think Snoopy had a tune on there as well. Yes, yeah, they're like a good dozen plus dubs over the course of a couple of months. Yeah, that um was the most exciting thing going on at the time, and people still talk to me about that now. And considering it was like two thousand six, it's wicked. So I think I was requested. I think when the war was kicking off a. Of about a year or two ago, I think it was a question for you to It's go. funny when people say, oh, can you do a war report now? I'm like, bro, like everything's out there. Everything's out there and there's like 70,000. Didn't you do one though? Didn't you go on? I tried to do articles on the Keeping It Grimy news thing, but like doing a war report when there's like three new dubs a day across two weeks becomes a bit mad. <laughs> it's, it's like an encyclopedia then. It's not like a, you know, going from like 12... 15 tunes on one CD after two months to here's the 23rd reply from this other MC who's jumped in because he doesn't like him was yeah and I think it's a bit redundant now like media is really different people don't listen to radio anywhere near in the same way that they used to do so even 10 years ago let alone 20 years ago um, no one wants CDs of anything what's the point in having that you know everything's just archived out there you know, get your stuff on YouTube. Even if it's a lyric video, put it up and you're there. People can access you. So quick one, as a gram DJ, obviously yeah. radio is not as important as it was. What is, what can you do as a new gram DJ? That's what DJ I'm trying to the, find yeah, right now. Talking about as, this, yeah. as an old gram DJ, not even a new, like, fuck knows what a new DJ does now. Um, <clears throat> especially in grime. But for me, I'm really trying to look at what media people want, you know, and it's difficult because you get so much conflicting information. We're in an era where people want 10 second long TikTok videos, but here we are talking for an hour, long form, and everyone wants podcasts. So I think what you can take away from that is people want everything, but you just need to give them really good version of it, whether it's whether it looks amazing, whether the content's really good, really insightful, whether it's really clever and witty, whether it's funny, whether it's exclusive stuff that you can't get anywhere else. I, I, I think a lot of the things that I did when I started out still apply now, which is give people a reason to come to you, not someone else. And I did that when I started out DJing, you know. Do I want to be the guy that's cutting dubs? Because Glamour in OT cuts more dubs than me and, you know, Danny Weed cuts more dubs than me. Bionix definitely cuts more dubs than me because he had bare peas at the time. Um, so if I'm just going to be the dubs cutting man, I'm just the same as everybody else. So that's where the presenting came from. Yeah. You know, are you going to be the, are you going to be the blends guy? Well, everyone's the blends guy now. You've got this clever blend. Well, another DJ that's got more followers than you can just nick your blend and put it in their mix. And that's their blend. So what have you got next? Cool, you can do another one. But are you going to have endless creativity? Uh, it's really hard, I think. It's really hard. But you just need to find the thing that you're really good at and just double down on it. Like, always focus on your strengths, you know. Don't try and cover in your weaknesses. Just double down on your strengths. I wanted to ask you, actually, did you ever, did, was, did you ever get offered to DJ for a crew? Yeah. Go and tell us. Um, like, oh, it was discussed about being in Roll Deep, pretty much. Um, but I was, I like being, I like being a reporter, you know, I liked, I like being 
a custodian of grime. Wasn't you tempted when Wiley or whoever asked you to join the crew? Especially at that time, I'm oh, guessing. Oh, because they had DJs. So you know, they had Carnage. Had Carnage. And... Carnage is a great DJ. You don't need me, you know. And then they had Maximum. They had Max come in, yeah. Um, you know, I'd be doing something different. And I, I, I just thought anything you make that you want to push, I'll play anyway. You're going to play it anyway. I'll play it anyway because you deserve it. Um, I don't want to take bookings away from guys that are in the crew already or whatever and any of that dynamic. And I'm happy just because I want to play everyone's tunes and I want to play all of it and I want to cover all of it. I like doing that. Um, and whilst obviously I've got great friends in the music, I've got really long going working relationships with people in the music. I'm still really even handed with the attention and focus that I try and give. Uh, even to this day, I try and make sure that whenever I do anything, I'm covering the people that I genuinely see. Like, I'm, if I see you doing work, I'd really go out my way to just let you know that I see you doing work. So was it only Rolf Deep that you had the opportunity to... Um, that was only ever a serious conversation. Serious conversation, yeah. yeah. Okay, so... I think everyone else thought I was in Roll Deep anyway, to be honest with you. Yeah, they pretty much... It did look like that for a period. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of um, Kiss, what are the... Obviously, for me, I feel like growing up, hearing your radio, and I hear, hear Getz and Skepta on the same set of Clashing, that was a really standout yeah. moment for me. Was there any standout moments for you? Um, Standout moment. And also the the chip, mad mad, little nasty set, you know the the young. With all the like, youngers, that was that wicked, was special, man. yeah. The maybe yeah. instrumental, and that was, fresh, before, um, that was even before. That was even before he was filming, wasn't it? He was filming because yeah. that was on a different channel. Shout out yeah, to still up um, there, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah wicked. Um, I love the producer clash. That that oh, show, what, Teddy was, and all that lot, Flavor D. That yeah, was the that best was jammer. Teddy, when we played the Predator beat, yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> got Predator on the phone uh, obviously getting to premiere the Skepta tune was huge for me the Skepta Diddy remix Diddy yeah you know that meant a lot to be able to do that and give it the because I always just wanted to make things feel as big as they should have been you know uh, and, and I think we did that did. justice yeah you definitely did you know we got Diddy on the phone we made it a real thing um, obviously the P Money Money Over Everyone launch show 20 MCs everyone remembers Fangol of course um Moments like that, again, that's what I live for. These organic moments that no one would have predicted would have happened. Um, and you could run the same set a hundred times over and you wouldn't get the same moment, you know. Um, I, lo I just love stuff like that. Um, there's way too many to mention. I keep, uh, like, people just keep uploading clips and that. Shout out to The Metal Messiah and Idolatry on uh, Instagram. People keep uploading clips and I remember stuff that I've forgotten I've done. Um... But yeah, thank God for the YouTube archive. Basically, <laughs> yeah. It's a, and is there any more that you can remember that you want to want to um, talk about? Not specifically. Again, like I'm really bad with doing lists and remembering stuff. When you do it every week, it's really hard, especially like with like my neurodivergence to like pick specific, be able to go. Oh yeah, that happened at this time, and that happened. You go, oh, you remember that set? I'll be like, yeah, I can remember actually. And I played this tune, this tune, this tune, this tune, and he was wearing these crepes, and it was that day, and the weather out. Like, you remind me of it. I'm there, but like for you to go, so what were your top five keeping it grimy chosen one set? I wouldn't be able to remember um, anything I did. Anything I did with Roadside, absolutely cold. Anything I did with Stay Fresh, absolutely cold. I loved the era of. Um, you know, like Cozy and Murky and Family Tree coming through. They were amazing. Anything I did with Bloodline, again, absolutely cold. One of the favorite things I did was I had Nasty Crew on the show. Uh, and it was one of the only times I've ever invited another DJ on. And I got to go back to back with Mac 10. And Mac 10 for me is one of the most important DJs ever in the history of Grime for what he brought to... Um, technical aspect of mixing i think he's influenced so many people since you know the likes of spyro and spooky probably you know were inspired massively by him uh and you know just the the width of different because 
everyone thinks of like, yeah, Slimzy, dub play Godfather, had every tune. What Mac-10 was playing was a completely different record box. And a lot of the producers now that are celebrated in grime, Mac-10 was the person that was playing them first. So I think he deserves his flowers as well. So to get to do a back-to-back -back set with him on Kiss and, and really hail him up for what he did. And I always, I've always thought Nasty Crew were f absolutely cold as well. The thing I loved about Nasty Crew was they were a crew of artists and everyone sounded different. You know, like Double, Armour, Hyper, Storming, Rest in Peace. They all sounded different, you know. Um, what an amazing crew that has always been and so much great talent came through it as well. Um, One of the best crews come out of... A hundred percent, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. The talent is undeniable. You know, nasty and raw deep for me. I'm at the top, there. Up, very up, top. Those two. Yeah. Yeah. So how did your time with Kiss end? Um, basically, Kiss were trying to reduce the number of hours, especially radio is shit, man. Like commercial radio is very shit because it's all based on radar numbers, which is a method of doing, um, ratings and the way that they do ratings is they send a booklet through to people and they ask them to fill in a booklet and say when did you listen to the radio this week and depending on what those booklets are they multiply it up by about 20,000 and that's your radio ratings so you can imagine that the average person that listens to underground music cannot be fucked to fill in a booklet on when they listen to the radio um so commercial radio in the after the 2010s became more and more and more and more commercial and less and less and less interesting for me um more hours of generic music because it obviously got the best ratings and commercial radio is based off selling advertising and the higher numbers are the better you can sell advertising and unfortunately, seven, eight, nine o'clock went from interesting music, pushing the boundaries a little bit, even if it was just hip hop and R and B, like newer stuff, club stuff. It went to actually, you know what, we can play Rihanna again at seven o'clock and we can play, you know, this house tune again. Uh, and we can put history on at eight PM and play the same seven garage tunes that everyone knows. And it will get It'll get better ratings. And that happened. And they tried to reduce all of the specialist shows down to an hour. So mine, Hatchers, a bunch of other shows as well. I think they even did it to EZ, actually. I think EZ left before me. I can't remember. Um, bare people left the station because not only did they try and do that, they tried to also say that they wanted to own the videos that I filmed. Finally. But they were not willing to pay for anyone to film. So you had to fork out that out for yourself and give, them, give it to them? Yeah, basically there was no filming, but if there was filming, I have to give it to them, they own it. And I'm like, the maths are not math in here. Like at least stump up the hundred pounds to pay someone to come in and film, please, if you want to own it. Because I'm doing sets with like, I'm doing sets with like Stay Fresh and Bloodline that are doing quarter mil views and you're getting Justin Timberlake and Britney Spears on The Breakfast Show and your videos are doing 90,000 views, yeah, for these artists that are selling millions of units. Why, why am I going to give you my video content that's doing numbers? You're paying me £50 a show, by the way. Everyone thought I was getting peas off kiss. Yeah. £50, 50 pound a show. For all, that, for all those years? Yeah, Never changed. Fifty pound a show. Um, even the BBC's like two free bills a show. Yeah, two free. Yeah, um, and that's because they got better funding. So like for that, like nah, I'm gonna see you later. Gone. Bare people left. It's really sad. Um, Did that hurt you having to leave? Or yeah, because of course of I don't want to leave. I was in my I was in my tenth year. To 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 have to leave Kiss in my tenth year, when the station meant so much to little me growing up. And I'd done so much there and, and had so many memories. It sucked. Proper. Remember that, like, I wouldn't go to Kiss for like eight years. The first, the first the time week. I'd been to Kiss since I left Kiss 
was last month when I went in with Rude Kid because he asked me. That's the first time I've been back to Kiss. Was that what bad feeling? Why yeah. is that? Yeah, yeah, just, just not good, not good vibes, bro. Um, so when you have to leave, yeah, what are you thinking? What are you gonna do next? What What was the? I was plan? trying to like think what I could set up myself because if that's the way that commercial radio is going, like obviously radio, if if what you're trying to play is what everyone has access to anyway, yeah. Your your format is going to die because you don't want people talking. You're playing music that people have access to. That's a playlist. Now, Spotify weren't really a thing yet, but iTunes was. And I can just make an iTunes playlist with all the songs I want to listen to. And I don't need you. So what's the point in having you on? I'll just make an iTunes playlist. So I thought, okay, I will try and do this myself and do content myself and film sets myself. But literally same week as me announcing I was leaving KISS, Mr. Jam asked me to come down and um, do guest mixes every two weeks. 60 minutes. Yeah. So just did that instead. How was it over there? It's cool. Just went in, did it, left. Um, started taking camera down myself again, filming it for myself. They put it up though because they had edited it. So at least they, they had resources. Um, but the camera was mine. It's funny because all of my all of my videos on um, One Extra, people used to grumble about because because I take my own camera down, and I had like a proper Canon DSLR, fifty mil one point two f stop lens. So it's better than everything's looking nang, and their cameras are like DV cams, like fixed little lenses. Like there's a freestyle I did with um, Chip, and like the colours on his windbreaker up popping it looks amazing um we got the bokeh effect the background's all blurred out he's super sharp it looks cold everyone else is like looking a bit gray next to it so i used to take pride in that um i just like doing stuff that that looks great and is cool and i'm proud of you know i, I love putting the extra effort in and i used to do that for those uh, you know um the 60 minutes again we did cool things i, I was really happy to be like the first person to ever get Big Zoo on legal radio. Oh, you yeah. yeah, yeah. That one extra slot was the first time he ever went to the BBC, so that was cool. Um, some opportunities to present and host and do covers, and that was cool. I did a thing with Stormzy when we tried to get shut up to number one <laughs> over Christmas. Um, so yeah, just messed around, got to do some video stuff again. That's what I really wanted. I just wanted to do, I just wanted to do grime sets. Yeah. Like, that's all I. What I would just be happy doing is just going somewhere and filming grime sets and putting them up on the internet. I did you want to it. stay on there longer or do you feel like your time... Yeah, I mean, obviously I did. Um, I, I got offered a show on One Extra yep. um, and I accepted it because I felt like I could do some really cool stuff there. Um, I was really looking forward to getting the opportunity to do more regular video content, utilise the name of the BBC as a worldwide brand to go out there and sort of push grime a bit more, um, you know, give the dwindling number of young artists coming through that wanted to make grime more support and enthusiasm to carry on making it, you know, really lean into the nostalgia element as well and celebrate the guys that laid the foundations for it and, you know, hail up the art that they're making. Because for me, as I think I mentioned it earlier, but one of my biggest, biggest bugbears about grime is how it hasn't been celebrated as a really high form of art. Uh, and I really want to go back and give people their flowers for the for the innovation that they they did there. Um, but yeah, like so, I was I, I was definitely would have happily would have done that. Yeah. So your time comes to an end. What happened next? Um, I looked at setting up keeping it grimy as a platform to do a bit more. Um, so like as a news resource, we looked at that um, during lockdown. I started doing weekly news reports. With what happened this week in Grime. I'd like to pick you up as well, because you, you know what, you really was pushing the Grime History Season 1. Yeah. Yeah, you said some really nice things about that. So yeah, it's great yeah. content. Yeah. Like, 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 as I said to you, if someone does something good, I they deserve to be, oh yeah, my brethren's done this, and all I care about is my brethren, so I'm only going to talk about my brethren's thing. What music do you listen to? My brethren's tune. What shows are you watching? The shows my brethren's did. No, like, you did a really good thing, and I don't, like, obviously I know you in passing, but um, you're not my mate. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Mm. 
but the shows were cool. Like, you're talking to people that I've not done interviews with and I've been in the game for a long time. Yeah. Talking about subjects that need to be talked about. It's great. Like, more of this. So when I see it happening, it's what I as a... Like, fuck Logan, the DJ, the professional career music man. I'm a fan. When I see this shit, I'm excited about it. Do you know what I mean? So yes, of course. Of course I'll promote that. It's my job. Like, that's... That's that's the whole point of making This Week in Grime. It's a cool fucking thing that happened This Week in Grime. Definitely should be on there. And I wish there was more of it. Out yeah, there. why, you know why I mean? isn't there more? Obviously, you stopped recently. I basically took a day and a half out of my week to make those videos. Because, again, I'm doing it entirely by myself. Shout out to the guys at Studio Blup who made the graphics for me. But I edit the whole thing. So I filmed it in my studio in my house that I built. Uh, got the clips together myself. Edited it all together. It took me about a day and a bit to put it out and the, the engagement was cool get like 2,000 views on the videos but other than that got literally nothing out of it a um, couple of brands sniffing around about oh can we sponsor it nothing really happened so for me to take a bit over a day of my week and what I felt was I'm getting back towards that radio thing of oh man it's about that time this week you have to record this thing and it starts looming over me and I just wanted to avoid that because I wasn't getting enough out of it. Um, I would love to be able to do that, but I can't justify it at my grand old age, financially, time-wise, et cetera, et cetera. The ROI just wasn't ROIing. Um, but I would love to be able to do that kind of stuff. I think it's really important, um, especially like the younger artists, guys like Duppy who were super active when I was doing it. Like to be able to just come back and be like, one of the most active guys of this year, Duppy's dropped another single again. And it's, you know, you can check the video out here. That actually felt good to do, you know. It gives them a bit of a boost. Like, there's, you know what, there's someone yeah, actually Yeah, I had, I had people say, it. like, reach out, say thank you for it, like, like you've just done now. Like, I know it meant, because obviously my voice carries a bit of weight. So I know it meant quite a bit to people. Especially just to see the work recognised. Do you know what I mean? That's what anyone wants. If they work hard, they just want to be recognised for it. I feel like there's not that, in, at the moment in Graham, there's no outlets really... No. And we've got Trends Mag, but before we had quite a few outlets no. really trying to push the scene and sort of talk well, about I mean, Graham. let's be honest about this, right? This is amazing content that you're making, yeah? I've got no fucking idea how this makes anything back. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That like the YouTube views are not 3 million views, and YouTube revenue keeps going like this, yeah? So 3 million views 10 years ago and 3 million views now are not the same piece. Totally different. Right? So... All this has is cultural value. So that's important to people like it me. It is important, but cultural value to 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 um, steal a phrase. YouTube does not pay for views and cultural value, does it? We we all know that. Yeah. So something needs to keep these lights on. And unless you're the new exciting thing through the door. Brands are not falling over themselves. And we are in, unfortunately, a time at the moment where funding for the arts is at an all-time low as well. You know, so it's very difficult. Um, new artists must be very, very difficult for them. But the stuff that we're doing, which is effectively a legacy genre, 20 years plus deep now, like, that's mad to me because like when I'm when I started doing Grime in 2001... If you ask me about music that started in 1980s, I'd be like, what? Not, what? You put it like that? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Do you want me to care about, you know, the new romantics and stuff? That's not relevant to me. But I feel like Grime has so much more to give and I would love to carry on. And that's why I want to support anyone who is, really. Um, it's a very hard time for arts in general across the board. So I'm not pretending that it's only us, but, you know... We're actually also in a really interesting time musically for like black music in the UK where when Grime was popping off 0304, there wasn't really a voice for black music in the UK it, on that kind of nationwide cultural zeitgeist level. But now Grime is a genre alongside drill, rap, dancehall, Afro swing. Like there's so many genres that are happening at the same time as Grime, that are all trying to not only get the attention of the listener, but the attention of creative young people to make 
new stuff. And I think we've seen that a lot with Graham where kids are coming out and they'll go over there and make drill. They'll go over there and make this. They'll go over there and make that. Um, whereas for years, I just go and do Grime. That's the thing to do. Go pirate radio. That's the thing to do. Do you think that's the problem where a lot of the kids aren't doing Grime now because there's so much choice now? I think choice, but also just the options that there are in Grime. There's not as many as there could be. Um, it's quite limited, especially for new people. It's limited for legacy names, to be fair. Like, there are not a lot of places for us to play. I was talking to Oblig before, and, like, he's one of the most active DJs, and there's not a lot of places for him to play. That's crazy. Because it's the same kind of names that are getting booked. Even though he's doing shows all over the gaff on radio, content all over the gaff, playlists. I'm sure you find the same thing, like opportunities to actually DJ out are few and far between. No, yeah. Because what events the... you got you're going to play at? Grime Originals, Grime MCFM, maybe if Cheeky decides to do Eskimo Dance, but that's a coin flip. You don't know when that's coming. So you've got like two and a half events to possibly play Two and at. a half, yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's hard. It's really hard. Um, and if you're a young MC, it must be even harder to find places to play. But conversely, we're in an era, an information era, where you could be a young name like SBK who's just gone out and been like, okay, cool, I'm just going to look up how to do a tour. I'm going to look up who the contact is at this venue and reach out to them directly. So there are avenues to navigate, but I think it's very difficult to expect people who are good at making music to also be good at doing business and also be good at logistics because that is that's a unicorn now grime's lucky because we've made a bunch of unicorns because we've got guys that can dj produce and mc all over the gaff so there's some wonderful talent in grime but that constant pressure to create and do the organization and educate yourself and have the kind of brain that can absorb info it's a lot of pressure. It's tiring. Of course. A lot of people burn out and they'll go and do something else. Because at the end of the day, you're still only doing grime and you ain't going to have no number one hits with grime because no one has. So what's going on? Not to be on a downer. Like, no, but no. <laughs> it, it's difficult. No, we've got to be real. You know, yeah. we've got to tell the truth. And I hope to... that we reach a point where, like, I don't look at hip hop because hip hop's a big international multi-billion dollar industry. I look at things like drum and bass that are, like sustainable, self-sufficient. They've got their own ecosystem. And do you feel like we're going to get to that point in the next five, ten years? I have no idea. But do you that, know what I would do you like think the future is? Because you you've been here from day one. You've had the biggest radio I shows I think we need Grand. to find a perfect marriage between celebrating what's happened in the past and elevating what's coming now. Um, I think if we don't elevate what's happening now, there'll be a vacuum between the legacy names you know, your names like Skepta and Getz and Wiley and Dizzy that are like so far above the day-to-day -day scene in terms of their stature and their profile. And even like the, the, the music that they're creating is, is often very removed. Um, there's a vacuum in the middle of artists that are just career musicians. Not multi-millionaires, but, you know, guys that make a hundred bags a year off music, quarter mil a year off music, doing shows, putting on their own tours. I hope we have more of those coming through because that's what is a, that's what that's what a scene is, you know. I look at a scene as there's shows happening every week. There's shows for the guy that's charging 150 to DJ and there's shows for the guy that's charging two bags to DJ and there's shows for the guys that charge five bags to DJ. There's shows for all of them to play at different scales, different levels. Um, but that is a very big ask. Very. So what's next for you then, Logs? Obviously, <laughs> do you feel like you're going to go back on radio, do a weekly show? I know um, you was on... No. You've done a little show the other day. I will not be doing a weekly show on radio. Um, I want to curate things, man. I'm really looking forward to putting together stuff that celebrates the history uh, and, and really gives it the recognition that I think it is deserving of and missed. Um, and I would like to try and do some newer things as well. Um, it's a lot of time for not a lot of guaranteed return. It's all a big gamble. And the older you get, gambles become more and more, you know, 
ominous. So, and I'm quite fortunate as well because I've been able to turn most of my career, most of my hobbies into careers. So obviously do a lot of the gaming stuff and that's pretty stable. You know, every year there's a tour, every year there's events. I know where those events are, um, streaming, all of that, pretty stable. The music game is definitely the opposite of stable. Um, so, but I, I, I'm excited by the idea of multimedia and what we can do with it. Uh, and I continue to try and navigate that space and see maybe, maybe there'll be an, for me, the stuff that's out of my control are the economy. And I think if there's an economic turnaround in the next five years, then there'll be more space for arts to grow. We'll benefit from that. Um, and basically the attention from the bigger names, I think if, if we look at 2014, 2015, the thing that really made Grime pop off again was guys like Skepta, Wiley, Kano releasing very clearly Grime singles and that made everyone look over at Grime again. And that meant that people like AJ Tracy and Stormzy and then Big Zoo after them were able to, a novelist, were able to benefit from that focus and attention and elevate themselves as well. So That was a fantastic time. I think that's yeah. when I started really coming in to the DJ and it was... Yeah. Every, that's all I need, man. I just want to. I, I just want a couple singles, a couple week. singles from 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 the guys. We're not that far away. It only takes a couple of singles. Yep, yeah, just a bit of consistency. It would be, would be, it would do huge things. But we'll see. So, what has been your proudest moment? Wow, in your career, in my career, God damn, just one. Getting that show on Kiss, getting that show on Kiss was the biggest thing for me. I mean, a lot to you, didn't that? Yeah, yeah. It, it meant a lot to me at many different ages in my life. You know, it means a lot to me now. It meant a lot to little me that used to put the radio on when I was in secondary school. And it meant a lot to me who was turning up every week to rinse and trying to do the best show I could and stand out. Um, huge, huge deal. And the fact that it meant so much to other people and they still talk to me about it is is a big honor, you know, to, to get that positivity from people um, so frequently, that like, really helps lift me up. And, in life, you know. What was your lowest moment? Um, like losing out on a BBC show, I think. What did that do? What did that do to you? How did you? How did you feel? Um, feel like it was unfair. Do you feel like why me? Uh, it made me go and learn more about myself and how my brain works. Um, you know, I, I looked into my neurodivergence a lot more. Um, uh, understood a lot of the reasoning for why I was so interested in being involved in online communities and why I was so argumentative and uh, why I was getting so much from online engagement rather than other areas. Um, and, you know, I got a formal diagnosis for ADHD, um, looked into other things about how my brain works and I was able to just come to the conclusion that you know, in life, when you have the opportunity to be kind, it's very important to take that opportunity. That's probably the most important thing uh, that people can live by. And, uh, yeah, and try, I'll try and live by that now, to be honest with you. I think that's a good way to end the show. Thank you very Logan, much. Logan, it's been a pleasure. Always Thanks a pleasure, for joining me, bro. All the best, man. Love.